Hey, Elena. Hey. You should introduce yourself. I thought of a really cute introduction. Go ahead, introduce yourself. Hi. Um, I am Elena, and I'm a clinical psychologist. I'm also a consultant and a coach. So I'm all the things. Mental health and activity. Hi, I'm Miranda. I'm not a doctor or any of those things. I just like to talk about it. And Elena and I are sisters and we often, I'm knitting, and we often have conversations that I think would benefit other people. So we thought we'd start recording them and sharing them and see if anybody's interested in them. Yeah. Fair? I hope so. Fair. Yes, it's fair. So I, doctor, Dr. McSwain. Yes wanted to talk about boundaries and rules and self-worth because I have some of that tangled up in my mind and I like how you like straighten out the tangles uh-huh. right now with a little conditioner and a tangle teaser and get it together that's what I need and I was thinking about it because I'll tell you why I was thinking about it because you play with yarn <laughs> tell you why I was thinking about it I was thinking about when after I got a divorce from my abuse abuser and all of their narcissism, I struggled to co-parent because they were constantly trying to control me, constantly trying to insert themselves in my life in a way that was inappropriate for them. And because I was still emotionally like just wrapped up with them and the enabling and codependence and all of that, I just, I struggled. And I used to think that my boundaries would control their behavior and that didn't work and I didn't understand the difference between a boundary and a rule yeah it was that okay and how I'm moving forward in life so I was wondering how you conceptualize those things boundaries here we go I will define it first because I think that's helpful for having a conversation what are we talking about let's make sure we're on the same page so boundaries are restrictions that you place for yourself um, in order to keep yourself from harm. And rules are the restrictions you place on another person. Essentially, this is what you can and cannot do to me in my world. Um, yeah, that's, that's kind of the understanding I have now that like a boundary is if you do X, mm-hmm. I'm going to do Y. Mm-hmm. So the boundary controls what I do in right. response to but I can't control what you do. No, because we can't control other people. Okay. So I think about it in terms of what you're allowing for yourself. One, what are your expectations for yourself? Because that's where we should all start. What are my expectations for me? And how does that align with who I am as a person and how I feel about myself? Because what you will allow other people to do to you hinges on how you feel about yourself in the first place. So... For me, I don't tend to have a lot of narcissistic people around me because my spidey sense says, oh, you're going to try to encroach into my space in ways that I don't want you to. And I don't deserve that. So you can kick rocks. Mm-hmm. Or rather, I can skip myself away. How about that, right? Because I can't force you to kick a rock, but I can leave. <laughs> it may chuck one at you on the way out, but you know. <laughs> that is fair and then a rule is something that you try and force on other people but if we can't control other people how does a rule impact other people's behavior Side, also what you're willing to do so example we're in a conversation and maybe you call me you know what i can give you a real power i can give you a real example mm-hmm. so i'm talking with one of my my guy friends this is just no, not that that matters but either way he called me a bitch in a playful way. Yeah, it was, I don't know where he's from, California or someplace. Either way, I was like, pause, bro. I'll do bitches. And that was exactly my response to him. And he was like, my bad. Sorry, people in my world don't care. And I was like, yeah, I do. Not okay for me. Oh, He's like, you're not like other people I know. It's like, I'm aware. <laughs> I value myself more. I am not a dog for you to refer to me as such. It's not going to be okay. He was like, oh, all right. Now, 
at that point, we're at a crossroads. I have made a statement. I have put my flag down, lying in the sand. And he had a choice. He could have abided by that, or he could have continued to use whatever language he chose. Which then, now it's on me. Do I stay engaged in this conversation? Or do I exit myself from this, not only conversation, but maybe this relationship? And I then have to be okay with whatever choices I'm going to make. Because had he continued to play and had he responded in a, oh, you're just being sensitive, what that tells me is you don't value my opinions and my thoughts. In which case, why are you here? And that's how I think about it. If you can't value where I am, why are you in my life? And I'm okay with excising people out of my life. Yeah. But folks have to make a decision about that for themselves. What are you willing to tolerate from other people? And what parts of, ah, what are you trading in yourself when you tolerate the behavior you say you don't want? Right? Because it's a trade-off in that. There's a giving of oneself. If I'm willing to allow you to treat me in a way that's not congruent with my values and my beliefs and my own sense of self-worth. Ooh, don't get me talking. Don't get me That's what I'm talking about, self-worth. So I think about... Mm. Me pull my thoughts together. I think about when I was splitting up from him, or rather afterwards when I was trying to co-parent, and the idea that he would call, and before we could make any arrangements for the kids, he needed to run me down and put me in my place about things that were irrelevant to our conversation, mm -hmm. and I would get caught up because I would be reactionary. Mm -hmm. Like, let's say he would go, "Well, you're irresponsible." You shouldn't even have to be asking me to do X, Y, and Z. Why can't you do it yourself? And you don't know how to do this, that, and the other. How is that pertinent to this conversation? First of all, your assessment is wrong. But I think for myself, it was poking me in my feelings of insecurity. Mm -hmm. It was poking me in these feelings of I'm not good enough. And now you are reinforcing that I'm not good enough. But I want to fight you about it. My question. Why are you staying involved? Why were you, as this, staying involved in that conversation? I was freshly out of mm -hmm. the relationship. I hadn't learned the skills yet. That's that takes time. That takes time. So when I was freshly out, I would get embroiled in these arguments. And it's all I had known. We had been married for that long. This was the pattern of conversation. And as my self-worth increased, the less I could tolerate those conversations and it became it was easier for me to go mm -mm, I'm not doing this so but I didn't know how to set a rule or a boundary at that time because I didn't have the knowledge or the verbiage or anything so what ended up happening is I tell him you say another thing about me I'm gonna hang up the phone and then he would say another thing about me and I would hang up the phone Ooh. and then the argument would then just transition to text Ooh. So how did you boundary, or how did you set rules for him within that? What boundaries did you set for yourself within that? I realized that because it was so habitual for me, like I was, I don't know what the word is, but that was just our pattern. So I couldn't talk to him at all. So there was a period of time, all of our arrangements, all of our communication was via text or via email or lawyer. And what would happen is sometimes he'd send objectionable things and I would still get caught up in text, but it was easier to stop. It was easier to put the phone down and walk away. So you can hear my best friend in the background. She's like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so your boundary then, and I'm going to label it. So your boundary then was to restrict. Uh, I'm not going to converse with you verbally. And then only communicate through written form or through a third party. And then only if I'm hearing you. You would, if he sent you crazy things through text, you might set it down and I engage it. No, I would ignore it. So okay. what I would do is I wouldn't respond to the crazy. Well, I'm going to call it the crazy. I wouldn't respond to the objectionable. That's what we're going to call it. Okay. I wouldn't respond to the objectionable. If he was talking about me, my character, my behaviors, none of that. What time are you collecting the kids? Well, you and this and that and the third. I don't respond. 
or a repeat. You know, for no good reason, the petty in me would repeat the question because I knew it irritated them. And then it would amuse me and it would cheer me up. In fairness, that's what I did. That's how you say restricted. That was the uh, boundary that you put in place for yourself. I'm going to ignore what, the, what you call the objectionable mm-hmm. and just going to repeat myself until you comply. Yes, I found out that drives narcissists nuts. And I don't know why that is so funny to me. Yes, but what time are you going to collect the kids? Interesting, but what time are you collecting the kids? You know why? Because they can't take you on their tributary of praise. A tributary of objectionable. Objectionable, yeah. <laughs> They're not going to take me on that. And then it becomes interesting to see when they get no joy mm-hmm. from the interaction, the exchange, the pattern that they're used to. And that can't, he couldn't control my emotions because I wasn't getting in that. He, he would do more objectionable things in other right. ways. Because he has to raise the stakes now. Yes. But then I have power and control. It's like, oh, well, I can control your feelings and emotions by ignoring you and this is amusing to me and I think I've always been like that from a kid when I can see that I can annoy you and I'm not annoyed oh, then like it's our a whole brother, family trait time, it's a whole family trait one time I used to call our brother a specific name because it annoyed him and I couldn't mm-hmm. stop it's funny. do you know I call them grenades because at family gatherings I see our cousins do it and I was like oh it's all of us we were grenade throwers. We're like, Ooh. and then we would just watch the explosion and the fallout. I just so still... personal comedy. Yeah, it's it's a family trait. And it was interesting. So uh, separate from him, mm-hmm. yeah. I'm sorry. I'm just trying to. I haven't talked this out before, but separate from him, my self worth was growing anyway, because as I was growing as a person, as I was starting to learn my value and my worth. Other people in my life were falling away. People who didn't support my growth, people who were jealous of my growth because it made them feel bad about themselves, which was their own issue. They opted out of our relationship. And then I was kind of left with a small pool of supportive and wonderful people. And then when you that becomes your normal, you can't go back. Right. It's now you know better. Yeah, Isn't I know. It a, like, to loop it around to your other interest areas in life, it's like a plant that's outgrowing a pot. Mm-hmm. When it gets too big, you got to move it into a bigger environment. Like it moves into a different space. And yes. so if you try to put it back to a small pot, which is a mentality, by the way, uh, <laughs> it's problematic. Now the roots are being crushed. Now you're going to kill that plant because it's in the wrong environment. So same is true of ourselves. And can I normalize for people the fact that when you grow, that is naturally what's going to happen. People are going to fall away. Other folks are not going to be able to tolerate the fact that you've grown. Uh, You'll see the strength of your circle as you move up. And when I say move up, I don't mean promotions, although it can be that, but I mean in mentality as you grow, as you develop, as you become a better person, as your self-worth increases, as your self-esteem increases, Mm -hmm. you'll see who's ready to be with you in that journey because you'll see it in their behaviors. You'll see it in their actions. You'll see it in the way they engage you. You'll hear it whether or not they support you in your goals or if it's, oh, are you sure that's what you're supposed to be doing? I don't know if that can work. And sometimes they let those folks go. Girl, transplant me and let me flourish. I'm all about it. <laughs> yeah. And you're going to need different things. Ooh, can I say that? As you grow, you are going to need different things and people in your life. Mm-hmm. Because things well, have unless, shifted. Unless I got a caveat. So my best friend, my best friend who's sitting in the background mm-hmm. giggling and like clapping for you, mm-hmm. she and I have grown together. So as we've moved up in life, we like just both grow and support each other in growth. So we've never outgrown one another. Because you're both I, growing. Yes. 
Yeah. When people are stagnant and you're growing, eventually there's gonna a separation is going to occur. Yeah. And um for anybody else, because you've already transcended in this, just be aware that one is part of the process and then like, expect that. Expect your circle is going to change as you grow, mm-hmm. unless they choose to grow with you or grow in their own way. And sometimes their growth is going to lead you apart because you're moving toward two different things. And that's okay too. What what was that old saying? Like people could be for reasons or seasons or whatnot. Sometimes Mm -hmm. I think people are only in our life for seasons. And I think the root of that is we either we're growing or we're stagnating. So that's just part of what's going to happen. And sometimes that's going to be lonely. And sometimes you're going to have stretches of life where you're feeling really lonely because nobody else is with you. And that's also just part of the journey. And I think part of our inner work is wanting to be okay in that. Yeah. This is just where it's at right now. And I'm going to have to knit. I think for myself, one of our mutual friends taught me to label praise and I generalize that to intentionality. So Mm -hmm. in everything that I do, so labeling praise is like when you, I know, you know, but labeling praise is like, not just saying thank you, but thank you for closing the door. Not just saying well done, but well done, well done for knitting your entire scarf. You just make it very intentional. And I became very intentional in my language for everything. And that changed my life. So when somebody is in my life and they're acting up, and then now I have to make a decision, am I setting a rule or a boundary? Like what's happening really here? I am very intentional with my language. And I'm clear, don't do that again. You gonna see the end of me. Don't do that again. I'm out because I don't have the emotional resources to deal with this. Or you are not worth the allocation of emotional resources to deal with this. I'm very intentional in my language. And it's not for them, it's for me. Because when I label it, I'm like, yeah, my energy is precious. It's not for you. You acting up. Indeed. It isn't worth the trade-off. Because if I give you that energy, that means I don't have it for me in some other area of my life. What other thing in my world is going to suffer because I'm engaged in this? Mm-hmm. Woo! And when you start thinking about it like that, it takes on a different, whole different meaning. <laughs> the gravity of it. <laughs> it is I'll, tell you, I'll tell you where I struggle. I told you recently a very narcissistic type person. And I'm not throwing that around lightly. People are throwing around the word narcissist lightly recently. Mm -hmm. I'm intentional. A very (laughs) narcissistic person sent me a message that was all the way problematic. And what happened for me, because I, I got the message in the middle of the night. So I did not have the mental resources, but I knew immediately this is problematic. I don't like it. And it's sucking my energy. And that was enough. It was enough for me to go, "Mm, I don't want to engage with you. Or to question, reflect back what they had said to me instead of like, you know, being emotionally invested in it. And that is about my self-worth as well. And because I can label those things, I'm not investing in this. It was easier for me to set that aside. But where I struggle is then later when I'm like, why did that bother me? Because my instinct said, all of this bothered me, but I couldn't have told you why. And then I have to call my sister and go, why does this bother me? <laughs> it's interesting because the situation held up a mirror for you. Of, for you to reflect in. Oh, right. The situation yeah. happened. That situation produced a mirror. So now you could choose, like, do I sit in that for a minute and reflect upon why does that bother me? I mean, you could have ignored it. You could have been like, oh, well, for that, I'm going to do something else and go for a swim at this really cool spa I'm at. Or you could do, do some, some a little bit of work. And that's what you chose to do. You just chose to do some inner work today. 
because I, I very much value self-awareness and growth. Right. And things like that bother me. I only want to analyze that once. So the next time it happens, I'm not struggling over it. And then the next time I was like, no, let me understand this today. And then when I see that rock again, I can go, I don't want to carry this rock. I put that rock down. Oh, so you don't make life give me the same lesson over and over and over again. <laughs> that, I don't have the emotional resources for that. Oh, uh -uh. gracious. <laughs> That's so funny. You know what? This is all making me think about what is it? What are the barriers that keep us from honoring our own boundaries? I'm thinking about this. Uh, I would think fear. I think fear is a big driver. I think fear of the loss of relationship. A fear of loss of support. Fear of loss of connection. Because sometimes when we set those boundaries for ourselves, we say, all right, I'm going to have to make the decision to not engage this person anymore. What does it mean now if this person is no longer in my life? What does it mean if we're no longer connected in some way? And if they served another purpose, then where am I going to get those needs met? Mm. That's where my brain went. That is so interesting to me because I would never consider that. I was waiting for that noise to stop. I would never consider that. I would consider because if somebody is, I just call it acting up. So if somebody is okay. difficult and they need to be excised from my life. Mm -hmm. And the way I conceptualize that is I now have space in my life for somebody who is worthy of me mm -hmm. to fill in. Did I say that right? Yeah. Yeah. That's how I conceptualize it. It never occurs to me that I can't attract or draw or have people in my life that'll meet my needs. And I feel like I'm deserving of that in a way that I did not think I was deserving of that before. But I get it, fear. But I, I think for me, it always circles back to self-worth. What is the fear? So I lose this person and I lose companionship. But what, what are normal people afraid of? That they're going to be alone. That, that is my theory because I don't necessarily have those same fears in my life. I'm all like, I pick people up all the time. Uh, Just there are people to be had. Let me interact with them. But not everybody lives that life. And so when they don't, it's like, oh, will I ever find anybody to replace this person in my world? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's my hypothesis, at least. It's insecurity. Yeah. I don't think I have, yeah, I don't have that insecurity. I used to, but I don't. It's interesting now as you say that for me to see how far I've come. I think it's, uh, you probably haven't thought about it. One of the contributing factors is because we're applying this conversation to somebody you are already separating out in a relationship with, as opposed mm -hmm. to somebody you're, you're in the thick of a relationship in this moment where you're having to come to a decision point. Yeah. So we're applying this to a situation that's already run its course. And now you're having to try to figure out how to navigate the aftermath. But then, and I think how I've been talking about it a little bit has been, this is what it's like in the middle of a relationship. Hmm. Fair. See, but I love this discussion because I think these forensic analyses set me up for success in the future. <laughs> I'm going, no, I, I, my thought is like my thought is if I understand what happened I understand how I contributed to that problem I understand how I control my old behavior I get texts in the middle of the night I'm like mm -mm, not today Satan I'll keep it moving mm -hmm. that's it that was my thought okay that's cool I also think as you grow and as you take times, for example, in these moments to reflect upon yourself and what your inner workings are, I think the 
the better we can define what our boundaries are for ourselves, then when we're interacting with new people, we're more likely to hold them. Because mm. you already know what it is. You know what your own deal is. And then when you meet somebody and you can see that they're not going to honor the rules that you have, then it's much easier to walk away in day one or two of a possible relationship. Like, ooh, this is not going to work. And I've absolutely met people where I think, nope, not on any given day. Not on any given day. <laughs> not on Sunday, not on Monday, not on Tuesday. Mm -mm. Nope, nope, nope. Right? It was so impactful. I had to say it twice. I meant that. <laughs> Do you know what I, my brain, my ADHD went over here and thought about online relationships, not even online relationships, interacting with people online, because we do this all the time. Like we're all on social media. Well, not all of us, most of us right. are on social media and we're interacting with people. And I don't know folks that get caught up. So somebody will say something objectionable to them mm -hmm. online and then they get caught up and get like super emotionally invested in this argument why why because the boundary is you've said something objectionable so i choose to not engage with you i choose to block you and save my resources for myself because i deserve better that's the labeling see because i deserve better <laughs> peace Hashtag not today, Satan. <laughs> mm, because, months. like, be, but you know that, and you were intentional about that. This go, rolls back to intentionality. You knew as you were navigating your social media platforms what your own personal boundary was going to be. Don't come into these comments with the with the objectionable. That is not as fun of a word as crazy. I just want you to know that. Anyway, uh, don't come into my comments with your objectionable content. <laughs> Therefore, if you do that, I shall block you. It's like, boop, block them. And might make a soap named after you and profit from your objectionableness-ticity. Yo, you in those soaps. <laughs> but even so, what's the other ones? I'm trying to think of that. Oh, I have had so many of them. I've had the lazy. Un Somebody called, told me that I gave off troubled vibes. So I named it so troubled vibes. Yeah. Who's, who said you had mommy troubles? I can't remember what you made. That was it, so. troubled vibes, because they said- Oh, I, that was troubled vibes, okay. Mommy issues, and I was giving them troubled vibes. I was like, that's oh. okay. Vibes. Somebody yeah. said at the way I cooked onions and said I was lazy. So I created the lazy onion soap. <laughs> Mabel got upset and called us all murderers because they were a vegan and I was making soap out of tallow. So I made a vegan soap called Mabel's Peace. <laughs> okay. But poor Mabel couldn't see it because I blocked him. Right. Maybe Mabel has a friend. <laughs> For you and your objectionableness. So... I think that for me, the end of this, the tail end of this conversation is this, our emotional reaction. So we talk about setting rules and boundaries and all of that and where it comes from, but our emotional reactions to it, like how do we navigate that? Now I yes. navigate through petty and amusement because that mm -hmm. brings me joy. But how should people navigate through that? I don't know that there's a should. Um, I think mirror moments, some reflection, folks need to know for themselves what they need to do to manage their feelings. I think this is everyone, every workable adult, it would be helpful if you take some time and say, what do I need when I'm in a highly emotional state? So personally for me, that's walking. I walk until I'm calm again. That could be 10 minutes. That could be two hours. I have been gone for, I have done miles trying to get myself back together. And that's okay. Everyone needs to figure out for our needs to, it is helpful for them to figure those things out for themselves. When they're at a peaceful state, not 
trying to figure it out in the moment. But if you think about it, just spend some time with yourself. What do I need when I'm in these spaces? Then when something happens, you can easily go to the things that you've already identified for yourself. In life, I think it's helpful to spend some time deciding what your boundaries are. And when somebody comes up against it, immediately setting a rule and then honoring yourself. You say, you know, this person is going to push back against this. I don't deserve this. And then do whatever it is you have decided to do. And not, you don't need to justify it to anybody else. Oh, Lord. You don't need to justify your boundaries to other humans. And I say it again for those in the back. You do not need to justify your boundaries to other people. Second, remind yourself, I am, I am worthy. I am deserving of being able to honor my own boundaries and not giving people passes when they violate the rules. Oh, I'm sorry. That's a personal pet peeve when I listen to folks. They're like, well... And I'm, I'm using a he, she dynamic because I have lady friends. So well, one of my lady friends says, he did X, Y, and Z, but he had a hard childhood. He had a bad day. Somebody pissed him off at work. I'm like, you're dumb. You're dumb. What are you doing? I, I don't say this to my friends. I'm not calling my friends. I love that. <laughs> and I begin to wonder, like, why? <laughs> why? You're this beautiful, wonderful, warm, kind, loving human. Why are you allowing other people to treat you poorly? And now I want to punch your people in the face. Did you deserve better than that? Yes, ma'am. Sorry, I just like devolved into my own head for a moment. <laughs> I enjoy it when you do so. But what I, my main takeaway from what you said is that it is natural and normal to react and don't judge yourself yeah. for having an emotional reaction to the objectionable. Oh, that's right. That's what you asked me to begin with. So <laughs> but that's, okay. that's okay. But that was my biggest takeaway from that because I think sometimes, not even I think, absolutely sometimes I judge myself for even getting caught up in the first place as if I'm not a human being with human emotions and human reactions. Because apparently, I think I should be superhuman. Unless you got up today and walked on water, I think you're good. Um, there's grace for that, right? Sometimes we're going to have emotional reactions. That's normal. There's grace for that. And please, if you can remind yourself to give yourself as much grace as you give to other people, that'd be super fantastic. Um, and I would hope that over time, just for people in general, as they decide what their boundaries are, as they decide what the rules are for the people who are around them, uh, that, ooh, I think the emotional response is centered in the fact that I now can't control what you do. Mm. And everything I'm doing is trying to fix and change what you are doing. Mm. Like, if you just understood my position, then you would have more empathy for me. If you could feel what I feel, then you wouldn't treat me so poorly. When, in fact, it is not about you. <laughs> it is about the other person. Mm -hmm. And whatever stuff has happened in their life that dictates how they're navigating the world, it has nothing to do with you as a person. So you don't have to own their stuff. Girl, yes. Because I spent, um, I spent a vast majority of my life being told that I was unlikable, that I was unattractive, that I was lazy, that I was selfish. And I am none of those things. And the way that my partners and other people in my life throughout my youth and adulthood and marriage reflected those things to me and I believed them. And when I realized that those things weren't true and I started walking in my truth, I could not convince them. And I thought that was about me. I could not convince them. I was like, no, I think there are people that like me. Mm -hmm. 
I can't be that bad. You and know, what let I mean? me provide you the evidence. This is the evidence. They're yeah, not doing with you. They're not doing with you. I kept trying to convince people who didn't appreciate me to love me and to want me and to value me. And I could not control them. And I, I think I have fought, I fought that fight for so long. I know what that looks like. And then when someone new comes in my life with that mess, not today. No, thank you. I decline. Thank you. There you go. Yeah. It's oh. where if you are trying to get your sense of self-worth and validation external to your person, or whether or not you retain control of that for yourself. Intrinsic validation, intrinsic validation. Mm, mm, mm. <laughs> you taught me those words, extrinsic and intrinsic. Mm -hmm. My validation comes from within. Within, yes. It I'm is more helpful to navigate that way in life. Yeah, I don't, I mean, if you're a person like me who is so used to being controlled, mm -hmm. then knowing that my validation comes with from within means that people can't control me from without. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right? Because you own your feelings, you own your responses, you own your self-worth. And what anybody else says is not a factor in that equation. Yep. And most of the time, I don't care. Most of the time, somebody says something about me, right. then sometimes I have very human reactions. What do you okay. do with that when you have the human reactions? It usually shocks me so much that I'm like, ooh. It's like I'm a little homunculus inside of my human reactions, <laughs> looking at them going, what is this? Where did these come from? Let's do a forensic analysis so I don't have to do this again. I don't like sitting in discomfort because part of being in a codependent abusive relationship is being in discomfort all the time. Mm -hmm. I can't go back. Mm -hmm. I cannot go back. So when I experience that kind of discomfort and I know, you know, I'm like, why am I invested in this? Why am I upset? Figure it out and move on with my life. Yeah. Girl, yes. <laughs> I have a precious amount of energy because I have a chronic illness. I only have so much energy and I think about every interaction I have. So how much can I invest in this? Because I only have so right. much. Right. You know, I also need to live and breathe mm -hmm. and eat and sleep and love my family. And talk to my sister so mm -mm. but uh we've covered a lot today i think yeah. i'm gonna leave you there. that thank sounds you so good thank you for spending this time with me always i love chatting with you i love chatting with you too because we're sisters <laughs> <laughs> i know what you thought hold it in <laughs> oh, fun. okay so anybody that's watching, thank you very much for allowing us to share our little introspective rambling conversation with you. And uh, we'll start recording more of these and sharing them. Thank you. Free therapy from the doctor. <laughs>